Okay, your last notes in sensation and perception, we kind of lump all these other things um, uh, like taste and uh, balance and pain into something called other senses. So I'll be quickly going through a couple different of these theories um, and then how you sense them um, in your world. So here are the things we'll be going over. Olfaction, which is smell. Uh, gustation, which is taste, touch and temperature, pain. Uh, kinesthetic, or the location of your body in comparison to like the ground. And vestibular, which is balance. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is touch. Okay, first of all, what you know about touch is that these are skin sensations, meaning that their only receptors for touch are located in your skin. Um, and we sense touch by a couple of things, by, by pressure, by warmth, by um, temperature, cold, and then pain is how we're gonna sense touch. So um, there are no, like if I was to cut open my skull and be able to actually um, touch my brain, I would not actually sense that touch because your brain tissue does not have receptors for touch, only your skin receptors do, okay? Now there's a couple different ways we sense touch and there's some ways that we can take those sensations and perceive them differently. So here's one example. If you take a coiled um, cold water and warm water and you actually grab it in your hand, your, your brain will perceive it as hot. It'll let go of it, which is really kind of odd because if you take the warm one separately and then the cold one separately, you can sense them. But for some reason, those two um, senses together make a hot sensation. Um, anytime like you have like a gentle uh, uh, sensation over and over like on your hand, sometimes it becomes itchy. Like sometimes that'll happen, you're like, oh, that, it creates like an itchy sensation. So perceiving touch can sometimes be sensed as something different, all right? But remember that touch, those, those uh, um, receptors are only exist in our skin. Here's another kind of illusion. It's called the rubber hand illusion. It's pretty cool. So here's what the illusion is. Here's my researcher, and this is my participant here. And the participant has her real hand is connected here, and this right here is a rubber hand. So it's a fake hand. And the, um, the researcher here kind of touches both the real hand and the rubber hand at the same time a few times. But then after a while, the researcher will only touch the rubber hand and the person will actually perceive touch even though they weren't touched in their real hand. So that's called the rubber hand illusion, that we can actually look and think that we're being touched and actually feel touch, all right? I don't know if you've ever had that example where or something happens where like, uh, like you go to a drop a book and you move your foot in time, but you do still go, ouch, because it, like your body perceived that it was gonna be touched or something like that. So that's some, uh, a, a rubber hand illusion where you can actually trick your brain into feeling something that you didn't actually feel, okay? All right, two more um, other senses we're gonna talk about. Kinesthetics or kin kinthesis. this is um, my relation to the ground. So if I'm laying um, like this way versus this way, I can actually sense like my, um, where I am at, okay? And this has a lot to do with your vestibular sense, which is the, look, it, um, somehow you, you uh, associate this with balance, so, right? Whether or not you're balanced or feel like you're going to fall over. And your vestibular senses are actually due to, or um, we sense that because of something in our ear. So I mentioned this in your ear notes. But your semicircular canals located here in your middle ear have a lot to do with your sense of balance or whether or not you feel like you're standing upright. Okay? Our next sense that we're going to talk about is pain. Pain is super interesting to me because pain is actually influenced by a couple different things. First of all, it can be influenced by biology. So some influences from biology. Uh, your receptors, these are your actual pain receptors in your body. We're going to talk about the gate control theory, but that endorphins really have a lot to do with how you sense pain. So when you are under like um, uh, a lot of stress, like if you're running, like a marathon, okay, your body releases a ton of endorphins, and endorphins actually block pain. So you're running for 26 miles. This is something that usually could cause a lot of pain, and you're usually in pain afterwards, but endorphins block pain. Um, the phantom limb sensation. This is something that when people lose a limb and they're still able to feel pain in the limb that's not there. So for some reason, like they lose an arm, they're still able to sense their hand. Um, if they lose a, a leg, they're still able to like feel tickling in their legs. Um, and so that's called the phantom limb sensation. And then tintinous, this is a, a ringing sensation in the ear when there's not sound. All right, so it's not necessarily with pain, but this is when I sense something that's not there. So tintinous, that ringing sound in your ear when there's nothing there. 
All right, so let's talk about the gate control theory of pain. So there's, um, pain's actually influenced by biology and then social cultural effects. So pain, this is by Melzick and Wall, the gate control theory. This is the theory that suggests that the spinal cord contains a gate that actually is in charge of blocking pain or allowing signals to go up to the brain. And that this gate will be opened by the activity of pain that um, signals the small nerves and that it's closed by the larger fibers incoming from the brain. All right, so somehow your brain's able to shut off that pain like by overriding it. So the gate opens up with the small nerve fibers and then it's closed off from your brain. All right, so you can actually ignore pain if you think about it that way. That even though like the pain's coming in that you're able to ignore it and get through it. Okay, so here's actually bringing my brain back into uh, pain. So remember the somatosensory area of my cortex, right behind my motor cortex. This is the one that's sensation. Okay, so let's go down to my, um, my simple level here. So here is um, like the most small level here. Oh, sorry, there we go. Um, we have endorphins. Remember, endorphins can block pain. So the stimulation of endorphin receptors inhibits the firing to slow pain, right? So it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. All right, now this is coming off of um, a, a large picture of an inhibitory pain weight gate. So um, going back to the gate theory it's coming off of here. So if pain is coming up here, this is my slow pain fiber, it can actually be blocked by endorphins, and here is a neuron who's in, uh, in charge of inhibiting pain. So it actually closes it from moving on, it's inhibitory. Now, if that pain goes up, right, here, and then my somatosensory says, goes back and says, no, we're gonna block that. So this is actually that kind of gate theory on a, a, a level of, uh, of neurotransmitters and neurons, okay? So here's my pain circuit uh, step by step. So I step on a tack. The tissue in my, scent, in my skin cells senses that. It sends a pain impulse that goes to the noise scepter. Remember, that's uh, in charge of pain, my receptor in charge of pain. That crosses the spinal cord right to the opposite side, remember it goes, we went like this a lot with a um, vision or cross brain because it goes to my opposite side, that goes to my brain, oh sorry, I skipped over that, and then my brain says what? It's going to send it to the motor cortex to say go back or like move your foot away from there, okay? So there's actually going to my projection in the brain. So that's the pain circuit moving up, and then remember that pain is, um, can be controlled by this gate theory gate control theory where my brain can actually override pain coming in with those inhibitory neurons. Okay, pain can also be um, understood by psychological influences. So we talked about that rubber hand illusion, but you can actually also have memories of pain and that actually elicits uh, the pain again in your body. Um, you can see something happen that's really painful, like this. Like, uh, people who play sports understand that uh, they can make pain seem more painful than it is, okay? So, um, social cultural influences, so by someone really reacting to something, you can actually feel more pain than if you um, didn't have someone react to it, okay? Um, that's also true, like, think of, um, I think of, like, childbirth a lot with pain because some people are able to kind of override that pain or like if someone, everyone around them looks like really scared for them or nervous, sometimes they can feel more pain. So we actually can understand pain by this um, bio I'm sorry, biopsychosocial approach to pain. So my biology influences are my activity with those small and large fibers in my, um, uh, in my spinal cord. I can have uh, more or less endorphins released and that can actually be tied back to genetics and then my brain's interpretation of my um, central nervous system activity all right so where my brain can actually override that um, that's my bio influence my psychology or psych, um, psychological influence is how much attention I'm paying to that pain so if you're able to actually ignore the pain you actually feel it less and then my learning based on experience meaning that like um, I know that this is painful, therefore I feel more pain. And my expectations, sometimes feeling like it's going to hurt actually makes it hurt more. So being like scared of like getting a shot can actually make it more painful versus if you weren't really aware of it or not, if you don't expect it to be painful. 
my social culturals, the presence of others. So just having people, other people around can actually make it feel more painful or less painful depending on their reactions. Their empathy of pain. People saying like, oh, you look like you're in pain or, oh, that doesn't look so bad can actually have a big influence on how you feel it. And your, your expectations and your culture, meaning that some um, cultures um, don't allow pain or don't want, uh, it's not okay for you to express it so people actually um, perceive pain differently. And that all leads to the personal experience of pain, which can mean very different things to different people. Some people can have the same thing happen and, um, and report less pain than other people. Okay, so that a uh, little bit more on the biology, um, that endorphins we talked about, that runner's high, meaning that more endorphins are, are released so you feel less pain. We talked about the phantom limb sensation where they, they feel pain, something that's not there and then the ringing in the ears with no hearing. So how I can actually control pain, there's different ways. There's physical methods, so things that actually can, you can do to reduce or um, to uh, get rid of pain, but there's also psychological uh, methods, and these are more, I think, um, studied and more important to for the sensation and perceptions that you can actually psych yourself out of feeling pain by distracting yourself, by talking to others, by not expecting it. Um, people who go through childbirth uh, classes are sometimes like learn to like redirect their pain or to deal with it um, instead of necessarily getting rid of it okay last two senses taste and smell so taste um, taste is actually really because of your taste buds which chemically so these are our chemical senses so they chemically sense different things going on in your food and your drink whatever's coming into your mouth and there's different types of taste receptors or um, you probably call them taste buds you have sweet receptors sour salty and bitter and then umami um, is our last type of, of receptor um, and umami actually senses proteins and that's um, a, a, something that's actually genetic all right, so um, sweet, the survival, uh, why we have these different tastes. Um, anything that's sweet, like really high in sugars, means that it's a high energy source. So why do we eat really sweet things? Why do we eat things that are high in fat if they're not good for us? Because in, back in time, they actually were good for our survival. So we needed energy. We needed um, these different um, elements to keep us alive. And our taste buds are responsible for for saying like, yes, that's good, we need to eat it, or no, um, spit that out, it's gonna be bad for you. So you have sour um, taste receptors because those are going to get rid of things that are potentially um, acidic or toxic, and they're usually located like, I can't talk right there, but um, the same things with bitter on the tip of your tongue because they want as soon as it hits your tongue for you to be able to spit it out. So that's how we are sour and bitter. And our salty and sweet, we usually um, say we need to eat more of those because we need energy for survival. We need sodium for some really important things in our body, like our sodium potassium pump, sending neurons um, and just cell interactions, okay? So taste can mean different things for different people. Um, but again, this can kind of be uh, influenced by other things around. One thing that can influence our taste and actually all our sensories is something called sensory interaction. And that's where um, things interact and, and they change our sensation. So f uh, for instance, taste can be very affected by smell. The way something smells or even looks can affect how you taste it or how it tastes to you. So um, you maybe have seen like, or like when you have a really bad cold and you can't smell food, um, it tends to not have any taste, okay? Something looks really, really bad can get in the, in, um, in the way of you taste it, tasting good. So that's called sensory interaction. Um, the McGurk effect is actually um, the effect of uh, like sight on hearing. Um, so when I see, so this is some person that might be like hard of hearing. When you see the word said and hear it at the same time, you're more likely to understand it versus than if you just see it. So actually seeing someone's mouth move helps you understand what's being said. Okay, so that's called the McGurk effect, where I have an interaction of sight and hearing um, on, on, our, on my sensation. Okay, last one, let's talk about smell. So smell is called olfaction. And this is actually, remember we talked about this is the only one that bypasses your thalamus. It's a chemical sense. So you actually have little molecules of whatever you're smelling go up into your nose. 
think about that next time you smell fertilizer. Um, but anytime you have like popcorn smell, I think, or um, you're smelling flowers, there's a little actually odor molecule that travels up into your nose that stimulates your olfactory bulb and your, your olfactory nerve, okay? So remember we talked about back in the amygdala that we process smells very near our memory area, and sometimes that can actually trigger memories when you smell something, all right? And then it has to go back into the um, brain a little bit, that's where the taste interaction occurs with what's happening with your tongue. So olfaction, here's a, um, a up close thing. So I have little molecules of my flower that go up into my nose. They have receptor cells in my olfactory membrane that kind of lie on top of like, this looks very similar to like your retina. Um, so the odors uh, go to the receptors here. Okay, those olfactory receptors activate and send signals back and they're relayed ver uh, with the converging axons that go to the regions of my brain that have to do with smell. Okay, so remember here like this is my retina and it activates and it sends back here to my neural um, impulse uh, and goes back here to my brain. Something that's interesting with smell and age, um, as people uh, get older their sense of smell can change. So this is looking at the number of correct answers where it's like they put something in front of their nose and said, what do you smell? And they say like a flower or popcorn um, or grass, okay? Men have a little bit less uh, of smell than, or a sense of smell than women. But over time, we see women and young adults have the best sense of smell at around the age of 50. But after that, it tends to go down. So literally like things stop smelling as good and therefore stop tasting as good as you get older, right? So there's actually a bio, uh, biology component of smell and therefore taste because remember that sensory interaction shows that one affects the other. And that concludes all of our other senses put together. We'll be looking at this more in class and reading some stuff in your book to kind of um, fill in the gaps. But we are done with sensation and perception. Uh, we'll see you later.